Today we're talking about Mark. In the entire month of February, we'll be talking about the book of Mark. About different stories in the book of Mark. Marked. How can we take those stories and apply those stories to our life? See, Mark was written by the guy by the name of John Mark. John Mark was the translator for Peter. And when Peter decided to go, the Bible asked him to go into the Gentiles, that's our race, to, to share the gospel, to make the Gentiles available to Christianity. Peter couldn't speak the language, so John Mark was the interpreter for Peter, and he wrote the book of Mark out of Peter's life, out of his stories. So when we look at the book of Mark, we're looking at the life of Peter through the lens of Mark. And when we look at what Mark has to say to us, the first story I believe is so important. It's the story of authority. Jesus' authority. Now, I know that our church, we have many different political views. And I'm not a very political individual, but what I do believe in is authority. And the respect of authority. Can somebody give me an amen? Respect of authority means you do not have to agree with everything that the authority does. But you have to respect the authority that is put over us. And as Christians, what we must do is we must respect the authority that is put over us. And that authority is Jesus. So when we think about authority, what is the first thought that you have with authority? Well, the first thought we would think of is the authority of our president or the authority of, of maybe a teacher or authority of a police officer or a fireman or a coach. You think about men and women of authority, people that you look up to, people that you want to admire. So when we look at authority, what kind of authorities do we look up to? But there are some realities to authority the first reality is every one of us in this room has been burned by authority. Whether it's a church, whether it's a coach, whether it's a parent, you've been burned by authority. Somebody that you look up to hurts you. And sometimes when we've been burned by authority, we think of that. And, and sometimes we, we step back from authority. Sometimes we're afraid of authority. But every one of us has been born, burned by the authority. And then, because they've used that power and that authority in a wrong way, maybe sometimes we do not submit to that authority because of our past. But every one of us also in this room has misused authority. If you're a parent, you've misused authority. Instead of talking, you do what I tell you because I tell you. Or sometimes maybe a teacher or a coach or even a teacher in a class. We've all misused authority in some ways. But every one of us could also have a fresh model of authority. What does authority really look like? And then when you look at real authority, what real authority looks like, we have to look at our Savior. We have to look at Jesus. Because in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. When you look at all authority, that means everything about me is given from God to me so I can serve you. There's two words that work up in the word of authority. And the first one is dunamis, the ability to achieve power. And that's the power of leadership. The ability to lead. If you've played football, baseball, basketball, whatever you've played, or maybe a class president, somebody that exudes authority or leadership. Somebody that when they walk into the room, you know that they may be a leader because they have that leadership potential. That's dunamis. But then you have exousia, the freedom to exert authority, the position of authority. Sometimes when somebody is given a position of authority, if they are not willing to allow that authority to work within their life, they misuse that authority. But Jesus never misused his authority. Jesus never one time 
never one time in the scriptures ever walked into a place and said, I want that table. I want that position. Well, you can't have that position. He never one time said, do you know who I am? I am Jesus. I am the Savior of the world. I am the very Son of God. I want that table. He never one time used who he was to get what he wanted. He always served with authority through humility. There's never a time that Jesus used his power to get what he wanted. He always used his authority to serve others. When we look at our authority today, when you look at people in your authority, sometimes they use their authority to get what they want and not necessarily what God wants from them. So uh, there's a phrase that says, absolute power corrupts absolutely. When you have absolute power, when you are the one that can make any decision and you can powerfully use anything that you want and do whatever you want, it corrupts. And that's why Jesus says, all power has been given to me from heaven and on earth. Jesus had all power, but the power that he had never corrupted who he was. His eyes, his face, his mind was set for the purpose God has given to him, and that's to go to the cross and to save people from their sins. So how did Jesus use his authority? How did Jesus use his authority? I love these stories. And the book of Mark is just a bunch of stories set up. And we're going to take different stories through uh, the month of February and just talk about how, how the stories can relate to our lives. So I want to take about how Jesus used his authority. And then at the end, I want to talk about how we can use what God has given to us in authority in our life. So the first one is he freed people from their current bondage. He freed people from their current bondage. And in Mark chapter 1, Verses 21 through 28. It's a wonderful story of, of how Jesus was teaching in the temple. Let me just read this to you. Verses 21 through uh, 28. It said, Then they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them with one having authority, and not as the scribes. Now there was a man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you not come to destroy us? I know you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out and with a loud voice and came out of him. Then they were all amazed. So they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? What is this new doctrine is this? For the authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately the fame spread throughout the regions all around Galilee. Jesus used his authority to set people free from their bondage. Have you ever thought about that young man that was possessed by this unclean spirit? When you think of that, you think of a an individual, and you think of the person being demonic, but the person, that young man, was who he was. The demon possessed him and spoke through him. Could you imagine his life? Could you imagine everybody that shunned him? Could you imagine who he was? He looked out and he, says, he said, I'm not in control of my life. This demon has taken over my life. And he went into the synagogue and he was crying out and people shunned him. People laughed at him. People mocked him. He was not happy with his life. He hated his life. The antisocial behavior. The demon speaking through him. And Jesus saw past him into his demon's life. And he cast that demon from him. I don't know if you've ever witnessed that. If you ever witnessed somebody that we, we you know, we, we all have our kids and we all think our kids sometimes are demons, right? We all, we all, he's a little demon or he's that. But if you've ever seen that hollow look in somebody's eyes, have you ever seen a demonic action from somebody's life? You look past a demon, you see an individual. And you see that individual that's crying out for hope. 
crying out for somebody to rescue him. Crying out for somebody to love him. And when Jesus saw this individual, he said, quiet. He wasn't talking to the man. He was talking to the demon that was inside that man. And he told that demon to get out. And that demon left him. Left the synagogue. And that man was whole. That stronghold that that man had, that that demon had, that stronghold is, is just any time that, that, that Satan can take a stronghold within your life, things that you do, things that you allow Satan to take over in your life is a stronghold. And Satan holds on to that territory. And then he takes that territory that he's taken on to and he starts going into another territory. And if we do not stop Satan from taking over territories within your life, your whole life could be possessed. What we need to do is say, no. I'm not going to allow Satan to take another stronghold. I'm going to stop. I'm going to allow Jesus to free me of these bondages. There's something between you and your destiny. There's something about you and what God wants for you. Whether well, it's drugs, alcohol, or addictions. Whenever we give in to those strongholds, whenever we allow Satan to take over and we don't retreat and we don't fight, what happens is Satan takes another stronghold. What barriers and bondages are preventing you from saying no? Just like Jesus had the authority to cast that demon out of that young man's life, we have that same authority because we are under the blood of Jesus. And by the power that Jesus has given us, we have the same authority to say no to the bondages that we go through. Jesus had the authority to restore and to love. Now, the second thing is he forgave people from their past failures. See, <clears throat> when you're talking about forgiveness, that's a very difficult topic. Because forgiveness is something that's a very spiritual matter. But forgiveness is not forgetfulness now, is it? It's not that we forget whatever has taken place. We remember, but we have to forgive. One of my favorite stories in the entire Bible is found in Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, I've shared this many times, but it's when this paralyzed man was laying on a cot and his four friends took him to Capernaum. And they were, heard that Jesus was in the city and Jesus was in this little house and they brought this paralyzed man to Jesus. And there was no room for them to get to Jesus. Not even in, through the windows or through the door. And so they climbed up on the roof and they opened up the roof and they lowered, Jesus, they lowered this paralyzed man down to Jesus. It starts in Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. It says this, And again he entered Capernaum. After some days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately many gathered together. So that there was no longer room to receive them. Not even near the door. And they preached the word to them. Then they came to him. Bringing a paralyzed. Who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near to him. Because of the crowd. They uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through. They let down the bed. On which the paralyzed man was laying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there, reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is it easier to say that to the paralyzed, Your sins are forgiven, or say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the paralyzed, I say to you, rise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he arose, took up his bed, and went in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. I don't know why the man was paralyzed. But you know what? Jesus knew one thing. He said that there was people in the house, and he was preaching to them. And what is more important? What is more important? The healing of our life 
or the healing of our soul. See, our healing to our soul is forgiveness. He could heal, and he could have healed his life and stand, stand up and walk. And in front of everybody, they would be astonished they had healing. But Jesus knew more important than the healing of someone's life is the healing of someone's soul. Forgiveness. I love what he said. They lowered him down in front of him, and he said, because of their faith, I'm going to heal him. I'm going to forgive him. That's why it's so important. If you just take this one story, how important it is that you get people around you, men and women of faith, because of their faith, he healed his life. That means when you're struggling, that means when you have issues within your life, you don't have to go through life on your own. When you have issues in life and you have men and women that will lower you in the face of Jesus, and Jesus can heal you because of your friend's faith. I love what he said. Your sins are forgiven. Now, here's the neatest thing about Christianity. The neatest thing about our faith. I love the final destination. I love when I close my eyes and I die on this earth. I know that I'm going to heaven. I love that. I'm excited about that. But let me tell you about today. Right now. Do you know when Jesus looks at me, I'm a failure. I have failed so many times in my life. It is unbelievable. But you know what Jesus sees? He sees me as perfect. He sees me as sinless. Not that I am sinless because I am filthy. I am rotten. But Jesus, he covered my sins. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, as far as the deepest sea, he's going to bring my sins to his remembrance no longer. My sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. And I can walk in freshness. I can walk in knowing that God loves me. Not because I'm good. It's because Jesus loves me and I've accepted him. That's forgiveness. That's today. I don't have to walk around in a defeated life because I know Jesus loves me. But also... Because Jesus loves me, I also know that forgiveness is very important. I have to be able to forgive others that they have wronged me. And I need to ask for forgiveness of those that I have wronged. If I cannot extend forgiveness, then the forgiveness that God has given to me, oh, is not real within my life. There's times within my life that I have to be able to extend forgiveness. Jesus points out the faith of the paralyzed man's friends. And Jesus uses his authority to forgive. What about your authority to forgive? If you're a child of God. And as Al was talking about, go fish. Talking about your story. We all have stories. We all have if, I, I told somebody this week in counseling, you know what our church is? Our church is just a bunch of dysfunctional people that have a story that they love Jesus and they're just trying to hold on. And what we need to do is be able to share our faith and share our story and be able to allow God to work within our life and ask God to forgive us and extend that forgiveness to others. But that moment of forgiveness... When God speaks to you and says, you have to do something. You have to go. There's people in our lives where we have to offer our forgiveness. There's people that we have to swallow our pride and say, I was wrong. This is on me. Until we're willing to offer the forgiveness, we may never receive that forgiveness. Now, forgiveness and reconciliation are two totally different things. Forgiveness is, I am going to offer you forgiveness. Whether you forgive me or not is not the issue. I'm going to offer. See, we are not created to carry that weight of bitterness and hatred and animosity within our life. We're not created for that. 
But see, Jesus saw the man's life. And he said the forgiveness is more important than the healing. Because the forgiveness is spiritual. The healing is physical. We can go to heaven with a broken body. We can't go to heaven without forgiveness. And Jesus is offering this man forgiveness. And the man was forgiven. And Jesus says, which it is easier to tell a man your sins are forgiven or take up thy bed and walk? Anybody can see the physical. But the spiritual, that's between me and God. The spiritual is the forgiveness of sin. Spiritual is a clean heart. There's nothing sweeter than Jesus forgiving us. But the third thing is he empowered them for future purpose. In Mark chapter 6 verse 7. And he called the twelve to himself. And began to send them out two by two. And gave them power over unclean spirits. Empower others to make things last in the power that Jesus has given to them. He called his disciples and he said this. He said, I am going to empower you. You're going to do things that you can never imagine. I'm going to empower you to be my church. And that same empowerment that he has given his disciples to go out over the power of this world, he has given to the church. We have that same power. In the power of Jesus' name, we can do all things. He empowered them for a future purpose. We have that future purpose. Go fish. We have that future purpose and that future power to do things that only God could give us power to do. So when you look at those three, then you ask the simple question. How am I using my God-given authority? How am I using what God has given to me? If we don't use our God-given authority, it may wither away. If wrongly used authority may corrupt and destroy. If God has given to us authority... How am I using what God has given to me? Now, in this room, we all either will have authority or we have authority. Either we are a parent, we're a coach, we're a teacher. We have some authority at work. We have authority. So the first thing, does my leadership or my authority remove barriers so that the people I lead are free to succeed? Do I identify what's going on in people's lives? Do I remove those barriers? And as I look at the church, I say the same thing. Does the church remove barriers for people to get to know Christ? Or do we add barriers so people will not know Christ? Are we the type of church that will stick our finger in somebody's face and tell them to get out if they don't act the way that we want them to act. Are we the type of church that says, you know what? I want to talk to you about the love of Jesus. I want to talk to you about what God can do within your life. I want to talk to you about forgiveness. I don't want to talk to you about the barriers. I don't want to talk to you about the issues of your life. I want to talk to you about the issues of Jesus. And I want the Holy Spirit of God to correct you, to love you, to help you. Whether it's clothes, what's legalism... We don't want the barriers of this world to keep us from knowing Christ. And then, do the people that I lead feel safe? Are you a safe person to be around? Can people feel safe around you? Can, a simple question, can people be honest with you? Even if you don't know what they're necessarily talking about, even if you've never experienced what they're going through, can you love them and help them and encourage them? Because the authority God has given to us is not to judge. It's to encourage. It's to love. See, we are all sinners. And we all are in need of a Savior. And one day, somebody loved you and influenced you and helped you in the midst of your sin. The difference between who you are now and who you used to be is the encounter with Christ. And somebody you felt safe with, somebody that talked to you, that loved you, took the word of God and shared with you what Jesus Christ has done for them. 
Do you feel safe? And do people feel safe around you? And then, do the people I lead feel empowered with purpose? See, I believe, in other words, are, are you an encourager? Do you love people? Do you help people? Jesus said, you, saw, you see what I am doing. You will do greater things than I. I believe that's a true leader. And Jesus, with his authority, took his disciples and said this. He said, I'm going to show you what to do. But what you are doing, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you're going to do greater things than I could ever possibly do. You are the church. You are a blood-bought saint of God. You're going to do things that I could never even dream of doing. That's a confident leader. A confident leader is this. Somebody that encourages people. Somebody that helps people. Somebody that loves people. Somebody that tries to understand people. Somebody that doesn't take somebody's life that has been goofed up and says, I want you to come in. I don't want you to stay where you are. But I want to wrap my arms around you and I want to encourage you. I want to help you. I want to be there beside you. I want to give you purpose. There's greater, there's nothing more greater than somebody that feels they have no hope. And comes along somebody that inspires them for greatness. And the one that had no hope gets up and is inspired with purpose. Not because of what he has done. Because in his mind, he has done nothing right. But when somebody inspires them and lowers them down in front of Jesus. And Jesus takes what the one that inspires them to the one that has the hope, the paralyzed, the unspiritual, that needs forgiveness. But the one that points them to Christ lowers them down. And lets them see Jesus. And Jesus looks at their life. And he gives them hope. Not healing. But hope. Hope of their soul. When somebody has no hope. When somebody feels destitute within their life. When somebody wakes up in the morning. And they feel like I don't know whether I want to get up and go any longer. I am just tired. They need hope. And you know what the church is supposed to be? The hope of the world. Not the judge of the world. But the hope of the world. If we come alongside one with no hope. And inspire them to be who God wants them to be. Jesus comes alongside and does something very supernatural. A defining moment of time. When you and somebody with no hope collide. And Jesus is in the midst. That's authority. That's doing what God wants you to do. That changes people's lives. Can you do that? Is there somebody in your life that you've changed? Is there somebody in your life that you're a leader or an authority over and you come alongside them and you've given them hope? You've given them inspiration? You've helped them? That's what God is wanting you to do. But here's the other side of that. Have you said thank you? Have you honored? Have you prayed for the one that come alongside you when you didn't have hope? The one that come alongside you and to show you Jesus. The one that lowered you down into the very face of Jesus. Until we can say thank you to them, we may not be able to receive what God wants us to receive. Thank you, Lord, for allowing me to have my salvation, my forgiveness of sin. Thank you for the one that lowered me down and Jesus forgave me of my sins. When we thank them, God can do great things within our life.